In this free link building masterclass with Nathan Gotch, we're going to be discussing ChatGPT and AI SEO Plus, the best link building strategies in 2024, including how to get backlinks, how to get them for free, the role of PBNs in SEO, how Nathan survived and thrived after manual action penalties, some of the best AI SEO strategies. Plus, I'm going to give away some ChatGPT prompts, SAPs, and templates for free based on this conversation so that you can start putting these strategies straight into action. Let's go. So let's talk about backlinks 2024. What's the best way to get links in 2024? Oh man. Yeah. I've been doing this so long. I, my tactics have changed so many times over the years. And I used to be much more on the gray hat side of things. So that was like from really from the beginning when I started 2011 up until about 2015, I was more of a gray hat type of guy when it came to link building. And I, I learned some lessons there because I got penalized many times. And my biggest learning point is I used to be heavily invested in PBNs, right? And those still work today, by the way, it's just the risk is very high. And so I had a whole network. I had the whole thing. I had this, the sheet managing all my different expired domains. And I, I had the whole thing going. I thought I was a genius. And so, the, but then one day I woke up and looked at my phone and I had manual actions on my business site, on all my client sites. I had, I mean, they, they found my footprint. Right. And I would, I made a lot of mistakes back then. I was linking to multiple clients on the same domains to decrease the costs, taking a lot of shortcuts. So fortunately I got all those removed. And from that point forward, like all the manual actions are removed from that point forward, I basically decided I'm going to focus more on like a content centric approach. And I've basically maintained that same strategy from 2015 up until today in 2024. And what I personally like to do is I like to think about what is a natural way for a website to acquire links? I like to think about that a lot. And when you look at a normal website, not a site that's built by someone like us, <laughs> just a normal website that just gets links naturally. Typically, most of their links are going to be going to some sort of linkable asset, something that actually deserves links typically. And so there's a variety of things. Sometimes that's a simple, you know, how to based asset, right? It could be how to a listicle, something that's really valuable typically. Other times it's something that's not necessarily targeting a keyword, but is really linkable in nature. So that could be like a data-driven piece of content. Uh, that could be a free tool. Sometimes infographics was a little worn out. People don't really link to those as much anymore, but just some sort of asset that like actually warrants getting a link, right? So I always begin with the content and typically even, and this applies not just on the national level, but also on the local level. So like when we work with, let's say, you know, a lawyer, typically what you'll see some SEO companies do is they'll just start slamming those commercial pages with links and that works, but it just elevates the level of risk a lot more. So what I like to do is I like to minimize risk as much as possible. So what I will do is we'll build out, but depending on their budget, three to five linkable assets, basically right in the beginning. And we build those in a very unique way. Because usually what people will do, at least on a local level, when they're trying to, let's say, build topic authority, they'll create articles like, what is a personal injury lawyer? And that's like halfway right. That's like almost there, but that's, that's not going to really do the job because really what that's doing is targeting a national phrase. And it's not building that localized relevance that that lawyer needs. So what I do is I, I add one little extra piece to that, which is car accident statistics in Chesterfield, Missouri. Okay. Something very, very granular. And of course, if you go on these search tools, uh, you're not going to find any search volume for these things at all. But what I'm doing is I'm thinking about, okay, if I was like, if I was a journalist and I was looking for data to support some sort of article that I was going to be writing about all the car accidents that keep happening in this one intersection in Chesterfield, I want to be there. So when they do their Google research, I'm there, right? I'm the one that's there. So now I'm that reference point. So basically, if you can, you know, build out these linkable assets, essentially, you can then use them for your manual outreach, start acquiring links to those people are much more willing to link to assets like that. And then on top of it, once you're ranking, which you'll inevitably rank because it'll be so low competition. Now you've set these little seeds in place to ultimately start getting that snowball effect, start getting some links naturally. Right. And I think at the end of the day, like if you're trying to scale your link building, you have to have some level of natural link acquisition occurring. Right. Of course, you can accelerate that through other means, of course, acquiring other businesses and consolidating their link profile into yours. That's one way that I, I, I will do that if I need to. But if you're just buying links, like if, you're, if your strategy is just to buy links every month, like if the gap is huge between you and the competitor, it's going to take a really long time to get there. 
you may never get there in some cases. So you need some ways to get some scalable link acquisition. That's really only possible through content. So that's kind of as far as tactics, like the types of links that I get, it's pretty simple, honestly. You know, the traditional going out there, writing an article for another website, driving a link to that asset. Occasionally niche edits going out there. Hey, you have this article about X. We have this article about X. Would you be interested in doing a collaboration together? And we can talk about the tactics that I use to get those links um, because, you know, obviously I see people, I get hundreds of outreach emails all the time and maybe one out of a hundred are actually good and effective because what they do, and not to go on a long tangent here on you, Julian, but what they tend to do is they don't understand a value proposition and a value proposition in the context of link building. There's a few that you can use, right? And back in the day, you could do like, oh, broken links. Hey, you got some broken links. You know, here, we're here to give you some value. Will you give us a backlink? That actually worked for a long time. But these days, you will have basically a 0% response rate, something like that. So really, the only value propositions that truly work is some sort of exchange of content can work pretty well. Like we'll actually write content for your site. That's a good one. But the other one that we typically lead with is money. And I frame it very differently than other people. And I teach this in my training too, which is, I don't ever say like, hey, we want to buy a link on your site. I say, I lead with the subject line paid collaboration or something of that nature. So I always, I I treat it as if this is a collaboration between two brands, as opposed to, hey, we're a sketchy SEO company that wants to buy links on your site. And of course, I never outreach from my agency email. I always build out an email address for the company that I'm working with. So it'll be Nathan at blueshoesinc.com, you know, something like that. Just because I would think about it from the context of like, if I was getting outreach emails, like if I, it was like sketchy SEO company.com reaching out to me versus SEMrush reaching out to me, my like perception is going to be changed dramatically. Like if SEMrush is asking for a link, I'm going to be like, okay, I'll consider it. Right. I'll consider it. Right. Just because I know what they could give me in exchange, there could be a good exchange of value. That's a win win in some way. So you're just basically trying to find that win win scenario. And of course, money is a, a, a very good one. Let's just say that much. So that's one of the things we found as well. Like, for example, when we were doing link building for Hunter, obviously everyone in that space knew who Hunter was, big brand. And when right. you're reaching out from a domain like that, and we use like Hunter variations, you know, like dot. Code EK or dot AWZ or something like that. It would just convert so well because people would apply and say, yeah, we love Hunter. I've added it on Fiverr and blah, 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 right. and everywhere. And it was so easy. I think if you are reaching out for another brand, using their brand or variant of their brand, it works really well. How do you typically find the email addresses? Oh yeah, right away. I mean, Hunter is a good one. So yeah, I mean, I would say most of the time we start with Hunter and we see what we can get. And then if we can't get it from there, we may use one of our vendors that could sometimes be a five or gig. That could be something of that nature. And then the final, hopefully the one we don't have to use is manual digging into the site, which unfortunately takes the longest is the most time consuming. So, and then uh, actually, sorry, I missed one would actually be going directly outside of email going on social media. So going to Twitter, going to LinkedIn, just going directly into their inbox. That's another good way to kind of get around a lot of the email related issues. So we'll use whatever method we need to get in in touch with that point of contact that we believe has the, the highest probability of being able to place that link. Some of the things that I would avoid would be like going through a contact form. You might as well just not even try or sending it to like info at website.com or webmaster at like that stuff just it's basically a waste of time in some scenarios. So, and of course it gets really complicated the higher you go up the authority ladder. So like, as you go up higher in the quality of the site, the more difficult it becomes to figure out who that person is to actually place that link, right? Because like a lot of these huge sites, they have like, a lot of the writers aren't even, don't even work for the business. So like, if you reach out to the writer, they make, I haven't written for them in seven years. I don't think they, I don't have the ability to go in and add a link. So you basically just wasted your time. So you have to like find like who that right person is, as you know, can be not so simple sometimes. And then outside of that, you have to validate the email addresses, right? So, and that's, that's also typically we'll do, I'll use a gig for that typically just cause it's faster. So yeah. When it comes to the link building outreach process, you know, from content creation to literally negotiating the links, 
Are you using ChatGPT or any sort of AI to automate the process? Not a whole lot on the link building side. Obviously, in other elements of the SEO process we are, but as far as the link building, we're still kind of, I don't know, I guess we're old school still at this point, just because it's worked for so long, right? I mean, like we, once you have a process in place, it's pretty straightforward. You, you find the link prospect, you qualify that link prospect by looking at the, and we can talk about that, what that looks like, how we qualify a link prospect. Once it goes through that, vetting stage, then just finding the contact information and then sending the outreach emails. Of course, you're not going to get 100% success rate on the outreach emails. So you also need a follow-up sequence, which you can set up in Hunter now, which is pretty cool. And then from there, you're just negotiating. So on the point of negotiation, always, it's always fun because people think like if they reach out and someone says, okay, well, how much are you willing to pay? Well, I, I don't ever play that game. I'll be like, oh, how much do you want for a link placement? I'll, I'll make them tell me. So I'll say, okay, so well, what's your rate? And they'll be like, oh, it's $300 a place. And I'll be like, okay, perfect. We'll give you 65. I just, like, I will go for the most ridiculous offer because people don't realize you can negotiate. People think just because someone says a number that that's what it is. And it's not. And I'm telling you, I have reduced our link costs so dramatically so many times just by doing that. And people will literally, they'll be like, all right, fine, 150. They'll just immediately crumble to anything because they just, you think about it from their perspective, like, would they rather have zero dollars or money? It's easy so that's money, what I, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It's easy money to So, it. yep, exactly. What's your opinion on no follow links and sponsored links? Do you think they work? Because obviously Google's guidelines, they say no follow links don't work at all. I've seen some case studies. I've spoken to people like Cal Roof who've experimented with these things and a no follow yeah. link seems to actually help in rankings. What do you think? I think it's tricky. Just because it's a very small variable that's difficult to test among all the variables that we're looking at, right? And so it, it's very challenging in that regard. It's also challenging because we know that do follow links work, right? So trying to balance like, okay, yes, we can get no follow, but like we know that this other link type works with 100% success rate. No follow, it's hard for people to say at 100% success rate that it's going to work. Like, for example, if you did a link building campaign, you only build no follow links. If you were working with a client and you're like, we're only going to acquire no follow links, that would be really risky on your part to, to do that, right? To be able to get the result for the client. That'd be like a scary thing to do. It'd be a lot riskier. Now, with that said, I think certain no follow links have an influence for sure, like certain ones. And typically the ones that I would argue likely do have a big impact, Wikipedia easily. I have niche sites where, so like I have this one niche site, like super localized site. And what we did when we started thinking about link building, we were kind of looking around and we found this Wikipedia page about the city that we were going after. And one of the things in the city was like, who's the mayor of this city? And I was basically like in there, but on the Wikipedia page, it was wrong. So what we did is we created an asset that was an updated asset on that, on our site about who the actual mayor of that city is. And then when I went into Wikipedia, we did the edit, we replaced it with our link and it has stuck for, you know, up to a year now, almost. And rankings have just skyrocketed. And we haven't really done any other link building on that site. Like that's like the only link basically we've acquired. And that was kind of part of my experiment too, just to see like how well that would influence the results. And of course, we're doing a lot of other things outside of link building, but clearly there was a direct influence from that placement and then the growth immediately following. So... From that regard, I think some of them do work. Wikipedia, super authority sites, like I think there's definitely a benefit. Even though they're no follow, they're still hard to get. So, so I think there's value. But the ones I don't think have a lot of value are like anything that is not editorial based. So profile links, directory links, like those things, anyone can get them. So... That's why on those types of links, I'm not saying they don't have any value or any utility, but just as far as like being super effective, hard to say. So, yeah. Do you play around with tier two links as well to power up your, say, link inserts or wherever else you're getting backlinks from? Yeah, a lot, actually. Yeah. So what we'll do is typically it's based on the link gap. So like once we've narrowed a link gap for a particular keyword, let's say that page, we basically, we've hit the link gap relative to the competitors. That's where I start getting a little nervous. Right. Because I don't know if I want to keep slamming that page over and over once we're kind of in range of where everyone else kind of is. Now, of course, there's something to be said for having more links than everyone else, right? More votes, quote unquote. But that's where I start to kind of say, okay, we've got a lot of good tier one placements. Let's start to build the strength of these placements. I view it kind of differently because, like, I used to kind of think like I'm doing it to build the strength of my links, which I do agree that does certainly, 
naturally links are strained. So it does build the strength. But the reason why I like it is because it forces Google to recrawl those links, right? Like recrawl those two. Cause initially, you know, you get that initial benefit when it gets crawled and then maybe it doesn't get crawled again for a long time. So just getting it. And I'm not, I can't quantify that that makes a big difference, but at least in my own opinion, I just like the fact that it's getting crawled again. So that's kind of why I, I tend to do it. Where are you getting the tier two links from? Are they from like Fiverr or where are you buying them from? We'll still do relatively decent tier two links. So I know there's a lot of different philosophies on this. Some people will just like slam their tier one links. And I think, I just think about like, if that was my own website, I'd be pretty mad if someone like slammed it with a bunch of Fiverr links. So we'll basically just reduce the quality level slightly. And we're going to be basically looking at pretty much just all niche edits and we will outsource. So it could be, you know, one of those vendors as far as that goes. And you don't, when you do it, you don't feel bad when you, when you acquire those links, you're like destroying the site here. Like these are not like, like okay, really dirty links, basically. Exactly. And I, these days I don't do really any dirty type of, I have nothing against people who do, by the way, I don't care. I think it's all just whatever your risk tolerance is, go for it. Right. But for my risk tolerance, I can't play that game anymore. <laughs> so I just keep it like, I'll reduce the quality a little bit, but they're still editorial to a certain extent. So yeah. Yeah. I was speaking to Jackie Chow earlier this week, obviously another YouTuber who shows a lot of case studies and Carl Roof as well recently. And the overall outlook on niche sites, because of the low barriers to entry, because of so many sites getting hit during helpful content update, a lot of people feel quite pessimistic about the future of niche sites over 2024. If you're not building a real business and if you're not building a real brand, what's yeah. your take on it? Yeah. I mean, I understand the pessimism. So, you know, I think this is, this is nothing new. I mean, I know it's getting a lot of coverage as far as like niche sites getting wrecked and authority sites never getting wrecked, but this has been going on forever, right? I mean, this is the amount of people that have been building niche sites since I've been in this industry who are no longer in this industry, the turnover is a lot, right? There's always a new person coming in who claims to have the secret to building niche websites and then they get hit by a penalty and then where do they go? They're gone, right? And so I've just seen these cycles so many times. It's always the same. Everyone's starting to get fat and rich from niche sites for a while. Right. And, oh, we're making so much money. This is so easy. And then Google rolls out an update. So I've been through this a few times. I've been through so many cycles that I've just seen it happen so many times. And so like the most consistent variable among those cycles is that extremely strong web do not get hit by penalties. They just don't like when's the last time Forbes got hit. When's the last time Huffington Post got hit. When's the last time, like any of these massive authority sites or like ratings, you know, artings.com. They are ridiculously good affiliate website. I mean, like they're the model that I tell everyone, like if you want to do an affiliate website, this is the level of depth that you need to go to. So I think back in the day, we get away with a lot more. And I think these days you are playing a dangerous game. If you're just going to Amazon and throwing that into chat GPT and saying, write me a review. Like I have nothing against using chat GPT to write the review, but I think that the inputs need to be unique. So like what I recommend doing is like, let's say you're going to go into, I don't know, best saws, right? You're going to, that's what you want to do. You want to build a site about the best saws for cutting trees down. Okay. Well, as ridiculous as it sounds, you would have to actually figure out a way to test those. So whether that's you actually buying them, which would be pretty insane, or you would find someone who has a lot of experience in it already and have them be the experience that you need to create that content. Because there's just certain nuance that cannot be replicated when you have real experience in something, right? Like when you write something about SEO, there's going to be certain things that the way you say it, the way that you talk about it, that clearly demonstrates that you have a level of experience, right? Like the, it can't be replicated with chat GPT. As many as inputs and things that we do, like it just cannot, that nuance cannot be replicated to a certain extent. And I just think that's becoming even more important, right? And of course, Google EEAT and all that stuff, like whether it's a ranking factor or not, up for debate, right? But I think the general like philosophy of that, which is the experience side of that, which, you know, they added relatively recently, which is actually being able to show that you like actually tried the thing that you're reviewing, right? In the context of affiliate marketing. So I think affiliate marketing, like that pure monetization method is going to be the most difficult thing going forward. As far as pure organic SEO, like in Google, you can do it on other channels, probably easier, honestly. Like you could go to YouTube, probably do a lot better. You could go to Pinterest or wherever else, probably a better ROI in a lot of cases with less risk. But if you're going to try to maximize Google search traffic, 
you're going to have to really get serious about becoming like a niche expert, like whatever that niche is, right? And you're actually going to have to like, if you're going to start a coffee blog, you need to buy some coffee. You, know, you actually like experiment, controlled experiments. Like that's the type of thing. So, and how many people are willing to do that? I don't, I don't know many. So yeah, it cuts about yeah. 90, 95% of people, doesn't it? Basically straight away. What's so, your take on AI generated bulk content and those shameful YouTubers who are publishing clickbait, like I published 32,000 yes. posts in one video. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, I don't have any opinion about anyone's tactics, right? I mean, the, to each their own, to each their own. It's all about risk, right? And I think we all understand the risk of various tactics. It's not even a debate, right? Like if you want to be like the most purist, all you would do is find the best writer in the world on that topic and have them write the best piece of content that exists on that topic. That would A, be very, very expensive, right? Extremely. Like to hire a high tier subject matter level expert in certain fields, it could be a thousand bucks per asset, basically. And then if you're being a purist, you wouldn't even acquire links. You wouldn't even try to acquire links. You would hope that Google just or that websites would just magically find your content and they would just, out of the goodness of their heart, link to you. That's the most pure SEO strategy that exists, right? Now, of course, who does that? Like most people who are doing this are hiring an agency. And if you told them, all right, guys, this is what we're going to do the next month. We're going to write one piece of content and we're not going to acquire any links. That's how much we can do in your budget. Like how many deals would you close? Not a whole lot. So there's this weird dynamic going on here. So as far as like, as far as using AI, I use AI in our process a lot. I personally, like as far as clients go, we'll do a level of AI generated content to a certain extent. I'm never doing an auto generate personally, because I can't handle that level of risk. <laughs> like I can't sleep at night with that. I've been hit too many times doing crazy things. Now on my own sites that I own, my risk tolerance goes through the roof. I don't care what happens to a site that I own. I will do whatever it takes. I do not care if it gets hit and just build a new one. Like what's going to happen, right? This is the yeah. way that I see it. It's like for a client would never ever do that. You know, these sort of right. crazy experiments where you publish a hundred sites or 10,000 yeah. posts, whatever. For a client, absolutely not. It's out of the question. Just wouldn't be worth it for them or for the risk or anything like that. But I right. think if it's your own sites and you're doing public case studies, it's actually just a lot of fun to showcase these sort of things and to For show sure. people what's possible. Yeah. Yeah. And I really like that you do that. I like that you show everything that you're doing. Unfortunately, I don't show a whole lot of the stuff that I work on because unfortunately people have negative SEO'd me in the past. So I just don't, it's just too much. Talk about risk. The risk of me showing something is very high. Like I said, when it's my own sites, I push it to the limit. Like I will do, I have this technique called the merger technique. I'll go and, you know, find these expired domains and 301 redirect them to my site as a, in a form of like an acquisition. And like, I have some sites where I've done like five or six of these, right? And that's, you're like, you're starting to push it to the limit when you do that. And, you know, some of the biggest people in the SEO industry that we know of use this technique. They just did it in a little bit safer way. Like I won't name names, but you can look at their link profiles and you can see. So we all have the tools. I think, yeah, as far as clients go, I really try to reduce risk as much as possible. And plus, you know, they're paying, right? They're paying X amount of dollars. So I'd rather have like a legit writer writing their content. That way, at least I can sleep at night knowing like, okay, this is original content, right? Instead of like, yeah, this is working right now, but like, are we, is it going to stay this way? Because it is all, if you run it through any of the AI checkers, a hundred percent AI, that stresses me out a little bit. And in fact, I have this like ranking diagnosis checklist that basically you can run any keyword through it that is not ranking number one. So if you're number seven, you run through this ranking diagnosis checklist. And I just have all these different kinds of points across every variable that I believe influences rankings, basically. And one of the variables I have in there now, which I added, which is how original is this content? And, and so I put it at a 50% threshold, according to originality.ai. So if it's at 50, I think at that point, the waters are muddied so much that it becomes difficult for Google to really know. I think people give Google too much credit. I don't think Google's as good at identifying AI as we think it is. So That's smart, though. Yeah. I like the sound of that. Yeah, yeah. you check whether it's 50-50 and then yeah. it's in such a gray area that it makes sense yeah. and, and it's hard right. to, for Google to figure out. One question we got from someone who commented on our YouTube community post and he, he wanted me to ask it to you. It was, he said that I just saw a post of Matt Diggity, obviously massive name in the game in SEO. He said that human writers will be gone 
by the end of 2024, which is a bold statement. I can totally see where he's coming from. What do you think? That's a great hook. That's a great hook. Yeah. Yeah. So it's always hard because people like me and you and Matt and whoever else is creating content, we're, our job is to generate engagement. 100%. Right? So we know what he's doing. You know what he's doing. I know what he's doing. Like, we know he doesn't fully believe. Like, that. that's a definitive statement, right? It's very black and white. Of course, nothing in SEO is black and white. But with that said, I think there's a lot of truth to some of that, for sure. I've been saying this since when Jasper was really killing it and they were the only name in the game before ChatGPT launched in November 2022. I'm starting to lose track of time here. But up until that point, Jasper was pretty much the tool that you use to do AI content. And I still have Jasper content ranking, like now. Like I feel like from GPT-3 level content that's still ranking. But yeah, that when that was going on, like I was telling a lot of people in our training, I'm like, what this is going to do is it's not going to eliminate the top tier riders. I'm talking like top 10% level riders. They're safe because it just can't go to their level as far as uh, direct response type of copywriting, engaging copywriting, like, and just that kind of nuanced level of writing. But anyone who's in the bottom 25, their jobs are gone. If you're not a great writer, this eliminates all below average content that you would have typically needed to outsource to get, right? So you would have outsourced that to, let's say, the Philippines or India or wherever else it may be. And you would have someone who's not a native English speaker writing content for you. And I'm telling you, when Jasper came out and then ChatGPT, like just the auto-generated content is better than the outsource content, like from a manual writer. So when I saw that there was clearly a huge gap there, I'm like, okay, well, who in their right mind would outsource? And I feel bad saying this, right? Like, cause it has killed a lot of jobs already because someone who was maybe had a stable writing position in the Philippines, hopefully it's moved over. Now they're like a prompt, you know, architect, let's say, hopefully, but being a bad writer is a bad business now. You are not going to get away with being a bad writer. The ones who are really good, like, I just don't think their job is gone at this point. That's why I'm very careful to say things because things are accelerating so fast that it's almost impossible to predict the outcome of all of this. And there could be a point where I could put in a prompt that says, write like Julian you know, Goldie and in the way that he speaks and he have all the prompts specifically about the way that you write. And then it puts out something that sounds exactly like you. Right. And you can do that now, but it's not really there. Like if you went in and said, write me direct response, you know, sales page for this face cream, like, right. Like it's not going to be like Frank Kern. Frank Kern has a certain way of writing that's just so impossible to replicate, at least at this current GPT-4 level. I do believe at some point it could get so close that it's like, man, I mean, if you can get 80% as good as someone else, you should probably just take that because it's going to be a much better investment. So that's kind of the way that I'm, I'm viewing it. I'm just very hesitant to make definitive statements about anything at this point, just because it's... Man, it's changing fast. So uh, it's exciting though. So yeah. It moves so quickly. It's insane. But I do so remember fast. 12 months ago, January last year, it felt like there was a lot more pessimism about SEO. Whereas now it feels like there's never been more of an exciting time to do SEO. I agree. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I was on another interview. This is a couple months ago and there was kind of this pessimistic cloud over everything. And I was, I was saying that like out of all the decade now that I've been doing this, which is just crazy. I'm so old in SEO years, but I've never been this excited about SEO. Like really, like there's been so, there's been a lot of different times and a lot of kind of flat periods of just like, eh, it's kind of all the same. And I'd say like from like 2015 up until probably now, there really wasn't a whole lot of huge changes. I mean, you had, you know, the medic update, which kind of changed the dynamic of the SERPs a little bit. And just the level of quality had to increase. But I think about it from the perspective of how profitable an SEO campaign can be now on so many different fronts, like even small things. Like when I do, so in my keyword research process, one of the things that I'll do is I have a scoring criteria. So I have like all these different metrics that I'll use to determine like, okay, based on these metrics, these keywords are the best to go after in this unique situation. Now, one of the metrics that I use is like, what is the relevance of this keyword to what that business offers. 
So if I sell SEO training, ranking for something like Los Angeles SEO training program is a good thing to rank for, right? Although the volume is low and it will, the points will adjust based on that. Although the volume is low, I know someone searches that the probability that they're going to convert is very, very high. So I have a prompt that we use, and I have this in the training where we can have ChatGPT tell us what like score the relevance of that keyword to whatever our core offer is. So I just do on a scale of one to five. So if it's a basically a five out of five would mean like if someone searches that, the likelihood they're going to convert is like very high, like extremely high. They get a five. If it was like dupla checker, right? Let's just take a random like tool that I was ranking for, which I, for some reason, ranked for on Gotcha Sale. I don't know why we did that. The likelihood that someone who searches that, that's going to buy my SEO training, that gap is so enormous, right? That gap is huge. There's no way I could convince someone who's searching that to buy my SEO training. <laughs> like that's, the gap is way too wide. So the only thing that would work in that scenario is to get them like on my email list and then nurture them. And then the, the sales process is much longer. So I don't want to invest my resources and my time on that. So just even a small thing like that, because before I used to have to, manually do that or have one of my team members manually like assign the relevance. But now we can just throw in a batch of keywords and boom, we get immediate like scoring from the AI. So it's like those small little things that people don't consider that are just like huge time savers in the process. And the more time we can save, the more profit we make. So that's, you know, for me, that's what excites me. And then the other part too is like, which I don't think people talk a lot about, maybe you do talk about this on your channel, but the data side of ChatGPT, like the data analysis. Oh my gosh. That's like my favorite part of the whole thing. Like, because we're, we're building a SaaS tool right now and we had to hire a data scientist to come in and help us with like this one problem we were having it was so expensive. Like it was expensive to have a data scientist come in and like, be like, this is, he didn't even like really solve the problem. <laughs> it was really expensive. We were like, okay, this didn't really work. But now with ChatGPT, you literally have like a data scientist on hand for $20 a month. Like <laughs> it's insane. So have you, yeah. Have you tested it out for keyword cannibalization or clustering or what sort of things do you use NCO data and ChatGPT for? Yeah. So I, I think it struggles in some components. So like one thing in particular with NLP optimization, like, so it's really clunky with that. You know, I, I don't believe that it's, and this is just because it's not ChatGPT wasn't built for SEOs. It's not like it was built. Like we're using it and like we're trying to like find out ways to, to leverage it in the best of our ability. But like, I think that the on-page SEO tools right now are way superior to anything you could do with OpenAI or ChatGPT. And the thing is, I think like a lot of people realize, but like tools like Surfer or ClearScope or even the tool that we're building, like it is, those are AI-driven tools. They're using natural language processing, which is just a subset of AI, right? So, so it just doesn't feel like you're using AI when you're using, cause they're so streamlined. You're like, oh, this is cool. Like it, but you're literally, it's using AI to generate those, those ideas. And the advantage obviously is that, and I don't know, maybe there's some plugins that can do this with chat GPT, but, but the advantage of the on-page SEO tools is that it's scraping the actual ranking results in Google. Now you could manually do that with chat GPT. You could take all the content put it in a chat GBT, like the top three or something. And then it would just be a very slow, ridiculous process that I don't know why anyone would want to do that because the, the yeah. on-page SEO tools just do it basically automatically. So that, I think that's a huge weakness. And I don't believe that that's going to change because I just don't think chat, like maybe there'll be some plugins or something that people will create that can maybe do that in a more streamlined way. Certainly possible. But I think right now, at least as far as on-page SEO tools, that's a pretty safe place to be on that front. But as far as a keyword research process, like once again, that's the one area where I just don't feel like it's as good as the SEO tools that we have. I just don't like Ahrefs, SEMrush, like it can't compete with those. I mean, cause that data is being pulled directly from Google, right? And ChatGPT is making it up half the time. Oh, you know, it's, it's just guessing what, what it's gonna, what is relevant, right? It's just so. Yeah, I, I'm just, as far as keyword research, that's the one area where like, I'm still pretty hardlined about like using Ahrefs or SEMrush in the process and then using little, using ChatGPT in certain elements, like I said, the relevant side to accelerate some of that. But yeah, keyword research is a tricky one for me because I, I really have like a very streamlined process for that one. So 
What about on the work side of things? For you, obviously, you're at 84K subscribers on YouTube. So you've, you've absolutely nailed it. Are you trying to get to 100K no. or have you got any big goals for 2024? Yeah, I definitely wouldn't say I've nailed it. But but yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I want that plaque. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, that would be great. But, you know, I started YouTube not because I was hoping to get a lot of subscribers, right? Like I started, I started publishing on YouTube. Honestly, it was kind of a selfish reason, believe it or not. And the selfish reason was that I wanted to get over my fear of video. So I actually started publishing because I knew video was going to be important. And I was like, all right, well, if I'm going to get over this, I got to put myself out here. I got to do it. I got to even as, as painful and as awkward as I'm going to be, I need to do this. So if you go back, I have my oldest video still up and I keep it up. I keep it up because it's a benchmark, right? I want to see from that point, I think it was like 2017, maybe 2018 was my first, like where I actually showed my face. And I want to see if I've improved since then. And hopefully I have, hopefully I've gotten a little bit better, but I really did it because I wanted to get over this fear. And I was deathly afraid of being on video. Like you have no idea. I, I, I had like this, like really embarrassing experience. And like, I think it was 2015, we signed up for the Yelp partner program in my agency. So they came and by the way, don't do it. Don't sign up for that program. They came and they, they brought a videographer to, at the time I was doing my, I was building my SEO agency out of my apartment at that point. And they came and this videographer. And so I was like, I, I assume this is going to be like some really well-produced type of thing. Like, oh, here's your script. And the, but he comes in, he's like, all right, you ready to go? And I'm like, ready to go. What do you mean ready to go? Like, and so he basically literally put the camera on me. It was like, go, like, just talk about your business. And I like, I've never been so like lost for words. I could, nothing was coming. I just couldn't even like formulate thoughts. It was so embarrassing. I, my my wife was watching me, my best friend from college. It was just the whole experience was just traumatic. And I basically said, like, I will never record a video ever. And I and so for a long time, I had this like really crazy self limiting beliefs. And I would try to like find I would convince myself from different ways not to record video like because I'm I'm an above average writer like I, I am. I'm an above average writer. I will admit that. And so what I would do is I'm like, well, I'm an above average writer. So maybe that's where I should focus my time and my effort. Cause like, I'm pretty good at that. And videos for other people, that's for Gary Vee and those guys, right? The guys who are really charismatic and can do all that. So I convinced myself for a long time, like, and it was, I was really good at convincing myself not to do it. And then eventually I just decided, I'm like, all right, this is, this is enough. Like, cause I could see the trend. I was like, all right, this is clearly the trend. Brian Dean was publishing videos on YouTube at that time. And I was seeing like, wow, he was really like, he's yeah, getting a lot right. of traction. Yeah. And he was pretty early as far as, at least in the SEO industry, like really, he was a kind of a, I don't want to say like a pioneer, but he kind of was. I'd say actually before him, believe it or not, was actually Alex Becker. Honestly, Alex Becker was probably one of the earliest SEO people who like was publishing just video content and trying to build a business that way. And so I watched a lot of his videos and I was like, oh my gosh, he's so charismatic. I could never do what he does. Like, so anyway, I got over it, but I, I, I took baby steps to get to the point of publishing on YouTube. And so like, in, I basically um, got my feet wet with my training program. So at the Academy, I published like, I, I published like a hundred videos and they were all like over the shoulder videos. I didn't show my face. I didn't even have a microphone. Like I was recording directly into my computer. It, they were awful, just terrible. But they helped me overcome a lot of my fear just by doing that. And then I progressively just started building up more. I redid those videos, had a microphone there better. And then eventually I got the courage. And I think the first video I published on YouTube was actually just a video from my old academy because I was too afraid to like do a custom one for the YouTube. So I was like, I'll put this one on here, see how it does. It did decently. And then I was like, all right, I think it's time. So then I did a, 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 you know, talking head video of actually showing my face and man, when I watch it, it is rough. So, I respect that you know, though, man. Like yeah. for you to overcome that, it takes a lot. I know it does. And, and I think to most people, 90% of people, it doesn't feel natural. To me, it doesn't feel natural. If I look at my old videos, going back, it's weird. It's almost like looking at a different person because as well, yeah. each year you evolve, don't you? Especially if you're running a business. You're developing right. yourself. You're becoming the person that you need to be to hit that new level in your business. Yeah. And when I look at my old videos, I actually love it, but hate it. Like I love seeing the yeah. transformation. I hate cringing <laughs> so bad when I see the way that I talk or the way they express and articulate myself. It's not quite the same. Right. 
I'm sure it'll be the yeah. same next year or the year after when I look back at these videos. Yeah, and that's what it should be, right? Mm-hmm. Like we every year should be looking back and be like, yeah, I'm, I'm better than I was last year. Like that's really what we should be trying to do. So that's for me, like that was my initial kind of like I need to do this like for myself to, to do this because I know that video could be something really valuable for my business. And then the other part was like, I just want to be on YouTube because I think there's a place for me. It's a channel in which I can diversify outside of just Google and I could potentially, you know, get leads and all that good stuff from here. Little did I know that it was going to be my best lead generation source. And it's pretty wild. Like I, it's crazy even thinking back because I had no idea that it would be this effective. I, I, I just, I was like, I think it'll be a good, like, yeah, record videos. Like I didn't really have any expectations, but it's crazy now when I look at my lead generation sources, like the channels, like, well, let me rewind. Referrals are number one, email is number two, but then YouTube is number three. And then like Google is number four, but YouTube is so much better as far as lead quality, just because it makes perfect sense, right? Like there's this weird phenomenon that happens. And this is why I tell people to record video, because when you are on video, even though it's not like none of us are celebrities, we're not celebrities, but for some reason, there is a celebrity effect that occurs. Right. When you watch someone on a, on a YouTube video, this weird subconscious thing occurs where you're like, they're like a celebrity now, all of a sudden, even like it's like a micro, a micro celebrity, if you want to call their micro influencer, whatever it is, that has a massive influence on people, like a huge influence. And more importantly, when someone is watching one video versus reading, someone could read an article of mine and I may not move the relationship even a centimeter. Right. Like it could be the best article I've ever done. And it, they will help them. They're like, oh, that was great. Great to read that. But they don't know who I am. They don't know how I speak. They don't know anything about me. And, but on video, it's like instant connection, instant relationship. And the fur, every single second that they spend watching you is just accelerating that relationship at a speed that you could never do through text. It's not even, it's not even close. So that's why I think that's why it happens is like, when you give someone like you do, you give so much value, so much consistently, like okay. people just know, like, and trust you, right? They know, like, and trust you. And they say, you know what? I'm going to, I want to work with Julian. Like he clearly knows his stuff. I want to work with him. He's proved it. And you did it literally like with one video. Like if you, so for you to replicate that with text, you would have had to probably publish a hundred articles to match just that one video. And this is why we all know the gurus on YouTube who we, they you know, throw it, and I don't see the ads because I have YouTube premium, but when I didn't have it, the, the, the scam me type of guys that are pushing all this stuff, they're always pushing you to webinars, right? Why are they doing that? Because webinars accelerate relationships at a speed that just cannot be replicated in any other way. So, and of course, just video content. So anyway, my tangent on that, but I just, YouTube is great, man. It's, it's a, it is a. People even now, like people see like, oh, well, Brian Dean has 500,000 subscribers and Matt Diggity's got a hundred. I think Matt's got maybe 130 or something at this point. Neil Patel, I think is a million, like he just huge numbers. And they see that and like, oh, well, there's no way I, I could even go there, but it's so not true. It is a literal blue ocean because 90% of people will never record a video. They are too scared. Just a fact, I'm speaking from experience. I know that most people will not record videos because it's uncomfortable, it's scary, you think people are gonna judge you and all that stuff that comes with it, all the insecurity. But I always just remind myself, like right now I have, I'm looking like you, if you, my videos, you see how I have this background over here. But like my setup, I have a chair right here and I have a camera and the camera has no emotion. It's just sitting there. It doesn't judge me, it doesn't care about anything. It, I'm just there talking to no one. So like, what do I have to be afraid of? There's literally nothing to be afraid of. I'm just talking to a lifeless entity. So that's what I do to remind myself to just lower my expectation. And plus people don't care. It's another thing. Like people are living their own lives. We think that there's a spotlight effect where everyone's like super focused on us and like so concerned about every little nuance of our life and every little thing that we do. And we get so hypercritical of ourselves and it's so pointless, so pointless. So anyway. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think we're all supporting characters in everyone else's main film, right? Like, we all think that, oh, this person's judging me or this person's judging me for slipping up on this video. But actually, they don't care. They totally forgot about it. No. doesn't matter to them. And everyone's at the center of their own world. And then they have everything else outside of it. Yeah. I could talk with you all day 
about YouTube, but I know you've got to go and I want to be respectful. Of I do. Yeah. Yeah. It that's be amazing yeah, to that. get you on the show again in the future. For sure. Yeah. I know we, we did, we have more ground to cover. So perfect. Yeah. So anything you want to say before you go, what's the best way to contact you? I know you've got your training academy, which I saw has yeah. amazing reviews, high MBS yeah. scores, definitely worth checking out. Anything else? Yeah. I mean, these days I'm pretty much doing three things with my pie charts, kind of different slivers, but my academy is mainly my focus now, which is Gotcha SEO Academy. It's basically a training program for agencies. So we have other business owners and stuff that come in, but our focus is these days is pretty much just helping agencies on two fronts, which is beginner levels who are trying to build out the foundations of an agency, right? Trying to make sure that they've got their sales processes in place and all that good stuff that comes with the business side of doing this. And then the systemization side, which is actually getting the SEO result, right? So that, that's kind of two things we focus on. And then we do a little bit of SEO services, but it has to be like a really good fit for us to want to do it. And then the other part is we've been building a tool now for the last over a year. We have some beta testers now going through it and we're hoping this year we can launch apps. I'll be sharing more details about that. But yeah, you can find me at YouTube, gotchaseo.com. Hopefully you can find me pretty easily or otherwise I haven't done a very good job. So awesome, man. All right. Great meeting you. Thanks for being on. Thank you so much. Appreciate Cheers. it. So thanks so much for watching. What um, I'm actually going to do is take all the prompts, recipes, and templates from this transcript today based on Nathan Gotch's recommendations, including content development, email outreach, link placements, and some of the best prompts to automate all of those processes for SEO. So if you're an action taker, you want to put these strategies into action, what I'm going to do is put this into my free course. Let's find it. Where is it over here? And um, it's got over 150 chat GPT and SEO tutorials, but I'm actually going to plug this into the SEO system section. We're going to call this Nathan Gotch masterclass. The link to the SAPs, prompts and templates is right down there. You can get free access link in the comments and description. Thanks so much for watching. And if you do want to get a free SEO strategy session on how to get more leads, traffic and sales from SEO, feel free to book that in. We'll discuss with you personally building you a link building campaign that predictably and consistently delivers you more backlinks, traffic and sales to your website. We use Outreach very similar to Nathan to get more backlinks for our clients. And on that call, you'll get a free SEO domination plan. We'll answer any questions you have. You'll discover the best link building strategy for your website. And it's free. Feel free to book it in. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.